find a piece of wood. I've got a couple of blanks here, which are, I don't know, six or seven inches. That one there is ash, and I've just roughly cut that sort of octagonal. I do that sometimes when my band saw's got a wide blade on it rather than faffer end swapping it. And I've got this one, which I think is sycamore. Um, and that's, that is much more circular, but um, yeah, it doesn't really matter. But um, both got the, the natural edge on them. So I'll, I'll aim to keep that. This one, the bark seems to be pretty well attached. So I'll go with, I'll go with that one. This is sycamore and I'll just put my... <coughs> That's the British version of sycamore, for those of you overseas. Um, I know the British and the Americans call sycamore different things, but um, yeah, this is uh, what we would call sycamore. Um, so I'm just going to roughly sort of pick the middle of that and put it on a, a four-pronged drive centre on, on the lathe there. I'll just make a bit of a indentation just to hold it there. So I'm going to start this between centers. So I'm going to bring the tailstock in and then just hold that lightly where it is. What I want to do first is, is check my alignment at the face of the blank. And I'm just using my fingers here. It's about the right size for that. So if I put an index finger from each side, then that gives me a, a pretty good indication of where, where center is certainly within a few millimetres, which for what I'm doing here is, is adequate. So that, that's, that's about right centre-wise. Now, what I want to do with this when I mount it is to level these two wings. And I can see at the moment that the, the wing on the, far, the back side at the moment here, let me just adjust that camera so you can see both sides. This side is higher than this side. If it, if it looks close and you can't tell the difference, you can always bring a tool tool rest in and spin the black so you can see and I can see here it's it's almost touching and here it's half an inch away so so if I hold the blank push it against the live center and just move it slightly by while I loosen the tail stop I can just adjust the, the tilt of that without without moving where the center is so now I can check that against my thumb on the rest without having to move the rest even. So that's about right on those two wings. And then, then I'll do the same for the low points on the wings. This isn't really a very symmetrical blank. So, so the wing this side that, that's currently nearest the um, tool rest is, is a bit higher than the other one. So I'll compensate for that a bit as well by tilting the blank in that plane too. I'm not, I'm not gonna get a perfect balance, but um, because of the shape of the blank, but I'll, I'll just tilt it slightly. But you can see now the back end is, it's certainly angled off what I would call flat on the back, but um, that's a, just the way it is. I might just go a little bit farther, go to there. And then I'll check the wings again. They look about even. So at that point, I've not driven this into the drive center. So I'll, I'll I'll just turn it in a little bit more. But what I want to do, because that four prong center is mounted, let me just swing the camera a little bit, a bit so you can see, against this curve, I haven't got all four prongs engaging very well. So what I'm gonna do is wind the tail stock in a little bit and, and just drill it in. Do a half a turn on the tail stock, a couple of turns, and then what I will end up with is that blank drilled in and um, I've got a flat bearing surface then. So all four prongs are going to engage. And if I drive it in far enough, I'll actually cut through the bark and be engaging the prongs into the, into the wood rather than into the bark. And on some trees, some types of wood, the bark's quite soft and might not give you a very secure mounting. So doing this on that type of wood also improves the, <coughs> improves the grip. So it stays put. So that's gone in far enough. What I'll do at this point is just take it off because by doing that, you always end up leaving a little, 
raised area in the center of that. So if I just grab, I can do this with a spindle gauge, just, just cut that away in the middle. I could go to the drawer and find a carving gauge, but this is just as quick. So I'm just flattening off that bump in the middle so, so it doesn't stop the four prong center from embedding itself in properly. Hey, John. Hey. Okay. Yes, it is. Thanks. So that's flattened that off. Yeah. I can put that back on the lathe. I've got my mounting point and I've got the indentation on the, the back end. So now I can drive that in properly to give me a positive drive. So that's, that's it. That's ready to go. Set up my rest across the back end of this. And lock that in place and then spin the blank to make sure it's not going to hit the rest. And also at that point, grab my visor. So when I turn the lathe on, that's ready to go. Now I've set the speed on the lathe to absolute minimum on that range, which is a few RPM. But I'll put the visor on before I turn the lathe on. Start the lathe up and slowly bring the speed up. I'm standing in line with the head spot. You can't see me there, but if you, if you could, I wonder if you can see me if I switch to the uh, front camera. No, not quite. But anyway, I'm standing by the headstock here. So, so I'm out of the firing line of that, should it come loose. So I'll just bring the speed up. And while I'm doing that, I'm checking that there's, there's no serious vibrations. And on a blank of that size, I could probably go up to about a thousand RPM. I'm at 900 there and I'm starting to feel a little bit of vibration. So that's as fast as I'm going to go with that. In fact, I'll just back it off because it's at that it's vibrating a bit. So I'm at about 850. And on a, a, a sort of about a seven inch blank, that's that's about right. So that's not too bad. Um, so that's ready to go and that's still still attached to the lathe and everything's secure. So I'm happy to stand in front of that and actually do some cutting now. Um, first thing is to get a guide. So on the outside of bowls of that size, I usually just use a spindle gauge. There, there's one of my standard little fingernail grind spindle gauges. And I use that on the outside to give me the cut I want. Put that into a handle. <coughs> I'll show you the, the, the alternative, which would be to use a bowl gauge. Many of my bowl gauges are grown like this one, which is the or traditional grind or straight grind. It's angled back a bit. Um, bevel angle about, well, just under 50, um, 48 degrees. I'll, I'll explain why in a bit. Um, and the face is probably half of that roughly. So 25, 24, 25 degrees angle on the front. And that's very good for on the inside, but it doesn't allow me to do a pull cut on the outside because I don't have those swept back wings. So I'll just really reserve that for either push cuts or inside the bowls and use a spindle gauge on the outside. This is a around about a half inch spindle gauge. So we'll start with that. First thing I'm going to do is just flatten off the base, just using the left wing. Probably better if I switch to that one. Just using the left wing to flatten off the bottom of the blank. And this, this pull cut, I've got the, the flute of the gouge roughly pointing at my left shoulder, at, rotating the tool over at about 60 degrees or thereabouts. And what I want is for enough of the centre of this blank to be flat. You can see there where I've cut and where I haven't. And I'm almost at the point there where I've got enough space for my spigot. In fact, I think I have got enough space for this bigger. So I've set my 
dividers here to the diameter of the jaws. So I'll put the left point on the rest and just the right point in the air and mark that so I've got a score line where the spigot will be. You probably can't see that on a camera, but if I get a pencil and do that, you'll see where the spigot is or where the spigot will be. So now I just need to remove a bit of wood to make access to the spigot. This pull cut works in sort of forward and backwards directions. I, I do it this way rather than a push cut like this. If I'm doing a push cut like that, that I'm cutting straight into the blank and because of the grain direction, which is across the blank, if I'm cutting into it, I'm cutting straight into end grain twice on every revolution. You've got end grain, side grain, end grain, side grain, because the way the blanks cut. And if I'm cutting towards the headstock, switch to that camera and you'll see if I'm cutting in that direction, then I'm cutting in on this face, which is all side grain. So it's, a, it's an easier cut for me and it's an easier cut for the tool. So um, I'm all for making life easier for myself. So I'll, I'll just roughly cut the spigot at this stage and then I can move the tool rest and start shaping the blank. So I've got enough of a flat at the bottom to go with this. Put my rest across that corner. Again, spin it by hand to make sure it doesn't foul anything. And then I can start cutting the corner away. And initially I can be quite rough with that and take some moderately large cuts. Again, I'm using a pull cut. Which at points on that cut, cut is, is not bevel supported. So you'll see areas like there and 180 degrees away there, I get a bit of torn grain, but that's what I expect with the cut I was using. You'll see my cut more or less stops where the bark starts. That's deliberate. Um, and the reason I do that is if I cut all the way up to the top in the direction I was going, there's a chance I start pushing the bark away. So I've stopped when I sort of reach the edge of the bark for that reason. What I'll do is cut in the other direction. Um, you've come across this, the old adage that you cut with the grain, you cut downhill, and on a side grain mounted blank like this, that's from center to edge. So my cuts have all been center to edge. When I reach this section of the bowl, I'm more or less at 90 degrees. You imagine the grain direction is there. I'm cutting backwards and forwards across that point. The grain's running that way. I'm almost at 90 degrees. So it doesn't matter too much in, in grain terms whether I cut left to right or right to left. So I can come back up to the top of the blank, flip my rest round and cut into the wood instead of away from it and, and effectively push the bark into the wood rather than pushing it away. So, so this hopefully will just improve my odds of the, the box in where it's supposed to be. So initially I'll just start rounding that off and take out the remaining flats. And I'll just stop to check where we are with this. Um, so I've, got, I've still got a flat there, so I've got more to do. I need to cut more away just to get that fully rounded. So I'll cut into about there. Just a little bit of a flat there, so perhaps one more cut. But here I'm using a, a bevel supported cut and you can see there, I've got a fairly clean cut as opposed to what I was doing earlier, which is lots of tear. So if, as long as I'm using a, 
a correct cut with bevel contact. I won't tear the grain on this. It's, it's quite a, a tough bit blank. It feels, it actually feels harder than sycamore to me. I might be wrong and it might be maple or some, some, some other member of the Acer family. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I can't even remember where I got this blank from. It's one I found on the shelf. Still got a little bit of a flat there. So I want to get rid of that. Because I've got um, an, an uneven edge at the top here, I'm cutting wood, then nothing, then cutting wood, then nothing. I want to run the bank as fast as I can safely, with, within reason, of course. Um, so if I was running that at 250 RPM, I'd be bouncing off the, the, the corners probably, but by, by trying to turn it at a sensible speed, speed for its diameter, which on a blank this size, I, as I said, it's, it's around about 900 RPM. Then that gives me a, a, a better cut because running the, running the blank a bit faster, it's, it's um, the corners are coming around faster, if you see what I mean. So you, so you, you, you tend to bounce off the corners less um, running at a sensible speed. I'm just going to move my rest in. As you can see, that's, that gap's opened up a little bit. Just drop that there slightly as well. So I've got rid of the flat now. Um, I still need to do a little bit of shaping on that, but um, I'm sort of getting there. And, and then again with the bottom half, go back to that pull cut. Get rid of some of this waste wood. I can hear a knock when I go around there. So if you start to hear a knock, it's worth stopping and just checking what it is. I think it's a knot. There's a, yeah, there's a knot and there's just a little fissure just there. So that's what's causing the knocking noise. And, but that's, that's fine in terms of, it's not gonna be anything that's gonna cause me any serious problems. Um, sometimes that knock is a nail or something sticking in the wood that shouldn't be, but, um, not this time, it's just a feature in the wood. So now I'm getting closer to my final shape. I'll start to drop the handle down. So instead of cutting almost horizontal with the tool, I'm lowering the handle and doing more of a shearing cut, as they call it, a slicing cut with the, with the wing of the tool. You can see where I'm cutting there. And there's that. Comes out better with on the other camera. You see the position of the tool initially. That was my original roughing cut using the pull cut. Now I'm lowering the handle. You can see where the, the angle of the tool is going. Just dropping it way down there. So I'm doing a cut against the wood at the edge is probably at about 60 degrees. And you see the, the shavings have changed. So I'm getting those finer curly shavings now. That's always a, an indication that a, a more sympathetic cut. So now what I want to do is to blend my two halves in. I've got my top half roughly formed. Just get rid of that bump between the two. So now I can get right in on that spigot. And form my dovetail. The jaws I'm using are quite shallow. There's about, well, I say just under five degrees, uh, sorry, five millimeters depth. So my spigot can't be longer than five millimeters. So it, so it, it reduces your margin for error. You've got, um, when, if you think about it, if, if I aim for four millimeters and I, I, I'm two millimeters off, I've only got two millimeters spigot. So um, you see, there's not a lot of 
margin for error in that sort of way. So I aim, I'm aiming for about a four millimeter spigot. That's just a bit less than the, the depth of the, the jaw. And so if I've got a ruler there, I can see I've got about four, four and a half. So that's right, right. And just to check it, as long as I've got space, I can bring my jaws in there and look at it against the blank. And it's, it's pretty close. I think I'll just knock a little bit off the spigot. In fact, might have just been slightly too long. So that's that then, and then I can shape the, the the foot of the bowl. I'll leave a shoulder to run against the truck, and I'll leave myself a little bit of wood to reshape the bottom when I when I finish turn this and remove the spigot. I can either remove the spigot or I can make the spigot into the foot of the bowl. But if I just leave a little lip there and bring the curve up, then you can see the curve follows through the wood at the bottom rather than coming out into open air where I've got no wood to finish the shape. So bring that round and do the bottom part. So that's as far as I need to go at this point with the bottom. There's still a little bit of tear there. So I'll just do another couple of cuts, but before I do, just sort out the top. I need to just tweak this shape. So I'll take that down past the bark edge and then come up from the bottom to blend those two curves. Lower the handle to get my shearing cut. Not looking too bad. I've got rid of that torn grain there, and there's a little bit up here that needs sorting out in that middle area. There's a there's a little dark line there. It's it's sort of a um, not exactly a bark inclusion, but um, a flaw in the wood, let's say. Cause of what I don't know exactly. So I'm just dropping the handle, doing a searing cut across that just to clean it up. Again, cut in on the left wing with the handle very low to get that shear and angle. You see the shavings are much, much finer doing that cut. And at this stage, I'm just going to tweak the shape at the top as well. So what I'm doing is dropping the handle slightly, running the bevel across the edge of the bowl so I can feel the edge of the bowl. And then I just lift the handle and push it back into the cut. So I'm feeling for the edge with the bevel and then lifting the handle to bring the cut, cutting edge into play. So I've got the bevel on there without a cut and then you lift the handle to adjust the bevel angle so you are cutting. Because when that's spinning, it's, it's sometimes difficult to see exactly where the edge is. And if you do that to feel the edge um, with the gauge, you can feel where the edge is, then draw the gauge back, lift the handle and, and push forward and engage the cut. Just a little bump there. I'm just going to do a very light shear cut there. Hopefully that will level out that little bump I just found. What I want to do with this is try and get as, as good a finish off the tool as I can, so I don't have to do lots and lots of sanding. If I'm going to make this a thin walled bowl, then there's not a lot of thickness of wood to, to actually sand it. 
Right, so that's the outside shape. I'm not going to sand it at this stage. That fissure is, is still there, and by the looks of it, that's going to go in some depth. So I'm, I'm not going to try and get rid of it, because I don't think I will on this blank. I'll just leave it as it is. There's solid wood around it, um, so it's only a sort of partial depth floor by the looks of it in that term. So I'll take the tailstock away, take that off, and I'll just take the live centre out of the, the tailstock and take it off the lathe. This being a short bed lathe, the tailstock sort of gets in the way a bit at the bowl hollowing stage. Take out my drive centre and I can attach the truck. Any questions at that point? Take that as a no. Right, so we put this in the truck. And I'm just going to push it in with my thumb on the centre. So it, it seats itself on the jaws. And I'll tighten up the jaws. That's tight enough, I think. Now, that um, might not run through. It all depends on the wood and how much it compresses when you put it in the chuck. So um, you might find that's running off a bit, which this one is. But it probably, well, let's say less than a quarter of a millimetre. But because I want to go thin, it's worth me truing this up. So that's why I didn't sand it before I took the bowl out from between centres, because I've got to recut the outside. So I drew it up. So I'll bring my rest in and then just do it. I can continue with that shearing cut and just just true up the eccentricity of it. And I'll come back to a push cut. Could you change your camera please, Paul? The overhead camera. Sorry, Jim, what was that? Can you change the camera to the overhead one, please? Yeah. That's better. Thank you. Okay. That's good. Yeah, I'm, I'm just taking a very small cut just to true it up. And like I said, it's probably... I don't know, it may have been a quarter of a millimetre off, something like that. So I don't need to take a lot of wood away. Keep that handle low and do a shearing cut to clean it up. And once I've done this, I'll keep the blank mounted in the truck. I'm not going to take it out of the truck now until I've finished this, because I don't want to risk it mounting off center if I if I took it out and, and re repositioned it. Okay, so that's about right. That's now running through. So I can move my tool rest round to the other side. Bring this across and uh, Set my tool vest position and height. What I want is for this to be cutting sort of on centre. The tool cutting on centre rather than if I put the tool on the rest at an angle which is at about, I don't know, 30 degrees. The tip of the tool is going to be on centre at the point where the rest is in the right place. So the rest is below centre. So that's about right. Again, check. I'm not, I'm not going to foul the blank. Yeah. And I'll switch to the other camera. You probably get a better view of that one. Thank you. <clears throat> and initially, I'm just starting in the middle. But the actual position of the handle, if I just switch back. do that. You can see when I put the tool there, you can see across from the overhead view with the position of the, the handle. I'm across the bed of the lathe there to get the 
the, the bevel pointing almost straight down into the blank. So um, it's, it's all about the, the, the bevel control in the direction of cut. So I put the, put the, bev, the tool where the bevel is where I want it. I, I, it doesn't matter where the handle ends up, it's where the bevel is. That's the important bit. So I'm pulling that across the rest. I'm standing as close to the lathe as I can. And when the handle reaches me, I move with it. I've got my feet roughly shoulder width apart. I don't know if you can see if I switch back to that overhead shot. Let me just tweak that camera a little. Yeah, you can see my feet there. One of them is sort of in line with the tool rest. And the other one, I know it's only a short lathe, but it's, it's at the end of the lathe. I'm actually back past the end of the lathe with my right foot. So they're about shoulder width apart. And the idea of that is I can start my cut uh, with the, the tool across the lathe, bring the tool to my side, and then I just swing my weight onto my left leg to the finished position. So I've positioned my feet where I can do that entire range of movement without turning, uh, so without moving my feet. So I bring the tool in there, swing the handle back. I'm cutting above center there. Now the tool's at my side, I move with it to the center. What I want wherever possible is to have the tool at my side because by doing that, I've got maximum control. It's forming that sort of tripod of three points of contact. One point of contact is the tool rest. The other point of contact is my feet. And between them is, is the handle of the tool. So if that is touching my side, I'm bracing the tool against me standing on the floor. So, so it's, a, it's a, a firm support. Whereas if I've got my arm extended across the bed or I'm, I'm standing farther away, then I've got less control over this. Yeah, it's definitely harder than Sycamore. Cutting nicely, but yeah, it's a bit, bit tougher, than, <coughs> bit tougher than sycamore, definitely. So initially, I'm just going for a simple cut, just to get rid of the bulk of the, the waste at the <coughs> centre of the bowl here. And as I approach the centre of the blank, the effective peripheral speed drops in proportion to the diameter. So, so my cutting diameter effectively drops as the tool approaches the center. So at this point here, the actual cutting speed or the, the, yes. the speed of the wood past the tool no, is, is less than a quarter of what it is right out here on the edge of the, edge of the cut. So I've got to allow for that by moving the tool slower as I approach the center. So I'm cutting above center there, and as I approach the center, I lift the handle. So I finish the cut, hopefully exactly on center. Because if you finish the cut exactly on center, you don't leave that little pimple in the middle. slightly low there and it left a little bit in the middle so I just came out and lowered the handle to bring the edge to, to where it should have been. <clears throat> Throughout this cut I've got my flute at about 45 degrees. Trying to move that slightly. It's just on the verge of getting in my way, but I could just get past it, I think.
So I'm getting to the point where my wall thickness is getting lower. You can see here on the edge, the wall thickness is about 10 millimeters, three eighths of an inch. And here at the lowest point of the wing, it's more, it's about half an inch or more. So that's telling me that my wall thickness is thinner at the top than it is at the bottom. But so I can adjust my cut to correct that without having to use any calipers or anything like that. I just start at the top and cut in at a steeper angle to even up that wall thickness. Okay, so let's have another look. I haven't taken another cut. So you can see those, the thicknesses have reduced. That's now a quarter of an inch and that's now just under three eighths. So I've, I've corrected it a little, there's more to do, but um, you see the principle of it. I've now cut at the bottom, I'm about an inch thick. So I'm gonna leave the bottom where it is. I want plenty of support because my intention here is to make this a thin wall bowl. So I want to go moderately thin. So down here I want plenty of support. I'm on a fairly small chuck here, you saw, saw the size of that spigot, it's about an inch and a half spigot. So, um, and that's why it, I think it's been vibrating a little. I've got a fairly small spigot and I'm, I'm taking a moderately large cut, so it's, it's complaining a little, so um, that's to be expected. But what I'll do now is to reposition my tool rest. And I'm gonna spin it round, so I'm cutting in to the blank there and into the inside of the bowl. Position that as close as I can to this edge, lock it down and spin it to make sure everything's um, going past each other without, without hitting. I just want to move it a little bit more. Depending on the shape of the back of your rest, you may be able to get closer than, or, or not. It's all down to the shape of the rest. And this one's got a, sort of it's angled back at the um at the bottom edge so so it's sort of following the curve to some extent and and making that relatively straightforward to do the reason i've done that is if i leave the rest here at 90 degrees to the direction of rotation and i bring my tool round, you can see the angle between the tool and the rest is very narrow and that starts to become difficult to control and even at the edge, it means you've got considerable overhang. But by bringing the tool rest round, I put my tool on the rest. I've got less than half an inch of overhang and the tool is at 90 degrees to the rest. So it makes it much more stable and much more controllable. Sorry, did someone have a question there? No, oh, okay. So that's why I'm putting the rest where it is. So what I want to do now is to make the the top inch or so thin, as thin as I'm going. So I'll bring my handle round, start cutting in. And I've got to remember where, where the end of my tool rest is so I don't go so far and come off the end of the rest. Well, you can see I've got five, six millimeters, yeah, about five millimeters there and six or seven there. So I'm, I'm gradually bringing that round and evening up the wall thickness. I'm also gonna just increase the turning speed slightly. I've gone up to a thousand RPM. This is now as balanced as it's going to be. And that little bit of extra speed should give me slightly cleaner cut less bounce on the corners. But you see now we're getting down to four millimeters there and about five there. So it's, it's heading the right way. I'll keep going. Another cut. And that, what, remember what I said earlier about using the bevel to find the edge. If I can't see the edge, I can put the bevel against the edge there without the cut because I've just dropped the handle. Bring the tool back so it's off the wood, lift the handle and go forward.
So I find the cut with the bevel, come back off the edge, lift the handle and go forward. So I, I really don't need to see the edge. I just feel it with the gauge, feel it with the bevel um, and pick it up in the right place. If, if I guess where it is, I might take off too much and take the bark off or take a chunk out of the edge or something. So it's a, it's a safer way of feeling where the edge is. And you can see there where that knot and that feature comes through on the inside. I well, we wouldn't have cut it away. And there's another little feature just there. But that's, that's going to that's gonna go and we'll just be left with a, well, a little mark on the edge. Um, so I'm well, going to about four mil now. Yes. Paul, can I ask a question? Certainly. How is it possible to, uh, to adjust the edge with one size thicker than the other? Um, if you get this centered properly, the two, uh, two, two edges should be the same thickness. At, the, at that point. Here, yeah. we've got a thicker edge than here. What, what I'm pointing at here is the top of the wing. Let me just switch to the overhead. <clears throat> Looking at that end on, here at this high point, we've got a thinner wall. Here at the low point, it's slightly thicker because yeah. as I move down the, 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 the wall of the bowl, the inside edge isn't quite following the outside edge, so the wall's thickening up, and that edge is showing me that difference without me having to measure it. So, so yeah. all what I'm doing is each cut, I'm bringing the gauge around a little bit farther and taking a little bit more as I go in to, to gradually pull the two together. So, I've got uh, uh, yeah, with two, you, yeah, two identical curves. Then, yeah, understand, the day, with, yeah, with any bowl to get any um, a consistent wall thickness throughout the curve of the bowl the two curves have to follow each other, don't they? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's what I'm trying to achieve here. That at the I moment, the two curves it, yeah. aren't quite following each other, but they're not far off. So not, I'm, yeah. And with each cut, I'm just pulling it closer. So I'm, I'm down to sort of probably less than a millimetre difference now. It's, it's getting much closer. All right, thank you. <clears throat> okay. So I'm just going to bring my rest slightly nearer to the edge. And again, just make sure that's not going to touch anything. That's good. So that's the cut I'm doing with bevel contact all the way through and keep my flute at about 45 degrees. Here, I'm now at three millimetres and probably four at the bottom. When I get to the point where this is starting to get what you might call considerably thin, let me see if I can reposition my lamp. I don't know that I've got the range of movement on this. Oh, maybe. Just trying to maneuver it between cameras and things. Just about, yep, there you go. So what I can do is position the lamp behind the wall of the bowl. At the moment, it doesn't look translucent. I'm not quite there yet. It's, it's still too thick for that, um, but I'll, I might be able to see that in another cut or two. And then I can use that to gauge the thickness. And again, use the, use the bevel, find the edge, lift the handle. forwards stop there and take another look so we're down to just under three and that's pretty close to it at this point as well so I'm evening up the thickness still can't really see much through that but this is a very old dry piece of wood um, that translucency de work, definitely works better with a wet piece of wood where we've got so what a high moisture content. So we'll take another cut. Where you stop with this is really down to your sort of technique and confidence. Here at the top, I'm down to about two millimeters. That's about, that's fairly consistent, I would say. 
all the way around. So, yes, I could probably go another cut or two, but um, I'm not going to push my luck. <laughs> that, that's, that's not too bad. I'm happy with that. And, and no, I'm still not getting really any translucency with it, surprisingly. I thought I might with that being a, a light piece of wood, but evidently not. So I'm going to move my light back up here. And now I'm going to reposition my rest. I'm going to do this carefully because I don't want to wreck the bowl at this stage. So I'm, I'm going to make sure I miss the wings. And I'm also going to drop the rest slightly as well. The reason for that is I put the rest across the, uh, the, the tool across the rest, angling downwards slightly. When I'm on the edge of the bowl, that's hitting centre there. But if I extend the tool there, you see what happens. The tip rises. So I'm cutting way above centre. So to hit centre, now I've got to go beyond 90 degrees. So to compensate for that, I drop the rest a little bit. So I can now work on my next section of the bowl. And you can see with each cut, I'm leaving a step. That makes it easier for me to pick it up at the, at the bottom. Again, I can hear that ticking noise when I hit the, the knot that's there. Okay, set two, what we've got there. Not too bad. I can't, because I can't use the, the light for the translucency on this, the wood just isn't, isn't very translucent. I can pick up a set of calipers. I've got some of these um, the Veritas calipers and I can adjust the, the gap at the tip and it's sprung. So what I can do is to set that distance at the bottom of the bowl to the point where I've cut. Let me just flip that around the other way, it works better. So that's telling me the thickness at the bottom. Then if I pull the um, calipers up to the edge, I can see how much gap I've got. So I, I, at this point here, wall thickness is about double at the top. So I know I've got to go a little bit thinner. And when you, when you pick up this cut, just try and feather the, feather the cut in like that. So you take a very light cut to start with. You want the gouge almost following the internal curve, but at a, a slight offset. So, so when it picks up the curve, you don't leave a step. It sort of feathers in. So that's my thickness all the way around there is now consistent. At a, about two oh. millimeters. So I can now move on to a next section in wood. I can see here that knot is sticking out. See that? Yeah, like... <laughs> I'll, I'll take that out and throw it away. I'm not going to bother with that. I'll, I'll leave it out. It's, it's just a feature. Design feature. <laughs> I could glue it back in. I mean, I, because I've spotted it and saved it, I could glue that back in. Um, but no, I'll, I'll just leave it. It's just, it's, it's, I just see it as character. So on this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it. Oh, why don't you leave your rest inside the bowl? I can't Hello? really, because I've got a straight rest. If I, I could angle it in, but um, at this point of the cut, because I'm cutting closer to the bottom, I want the, the rest roughly 90 degrees to the um, gouge. Right, you, you haven't got so a curved I'm rest straight. I have got a curved rest. I don't know if it's, it's it's like a bowl turning rest, but I think the I'll show you the the one I mean. This one here, but I think that curve is probably too wide a curve for this size bowl anyway. So it's not gonna. It, it's really designed for, for working with bigger bowls. Oh, thank the, you. The whole thing there. So I'll stick with the straight rest. Leave it across the edge of the hole and carry on with that. So 
So I'm just taking a bit of this wood away from the middle. And then do another section of the wall. And now I can keep that gauge by my side at the start position and move with it because I'm two thirds of the way around the curve already. So that gives me better control right through the cut. A little bit more wood away. Again, I can stop and bring my calipers in. Put that on the next section. I've got a little bit more to go yet, but um, just to give me an indication, yeah, that that shallows up considerably. So it thickens up at the bottom there. What I don't want to do is to take my curve deeper than the outside curve because then you're in that position where the inside becomes bigger than the outside and that's all you bolt in <laughs> no, that doesn't work. The inside of the bowl has got to be smaller than the outside. So I'm about a millimetre or so away at the bottom there so another cut or so we'll see that to the right thickness I think. So we'll just take a little bit more away from the centre. Check the thickness there. So right down the bottom here, I can feel it slightly thicker. Yeah, a couple couple of millimeters to take out at the bottom. Paul, I, what, these, what I, grain do you have? What grain do you have on your gouge, please? This one, the bevel angle, is forty eight degrees, or nominally, let's say fifty. If I if I hold that up there. You can see it's, it's what I call a traditional or straight grind. Traditional, yeah. Thank you. Rather, rather than a fingernail. Um, the bevel angle is 48 and the actual rake angle on the front is half of that. So 24, 25. I don't measure the rake angle. I do, I do measure the bevel angle because I set a table to that angle and use a gauge to get the table at the right angle. So, so I do reproduce the bevel angle that way. But the, the, the rake angle on the front is just done by eye. So that's a little bit more off the side wall at the bottom. So I should be pretty close now. But when I get to the bottom of these, I do usually thicken the bottom up just, just a little, just to put a little bit of weight in the bottom, really. And that, that thickens up at the moment by probably less than a millimetre, but that's all right. Um, I'm getting close to the bottom here. I might be in a position, depending on the depth of this bowl, where I'm cutting down here and you can see where the wall of the bowl is and where the shaft of the tool is. If that was any deeper, I would probably not be able to finish the cut. What I need to do is to switch to a gauge with a steeper bevel. So if I, I mean, I've got one on the tool back there. So if I switch to a, a 60 degree gauge instead of what I've got here, which is just under 50, then that's what would happen. 
the handle effectively moves away from the edge and maintains bevel contact. So if that was deeper, I might have to switch gauges. But if I take a cut here, I'll just show you what I mean. Let's go to the middle. That's where I'm actually cutting in the middle. So it's, it's, it's not quite as bad as I exaggerated there. So that's my angle of cut. You can see I can just about get my finger between the, the gouge shaft and the wall of the bowl. If I do that same cut with this gauge, this is a 60 degree grind on it. So that's where I'm getting my cut. You see the difference in distance there. I can now get two fingers between the wall and the gauge. And that's because I've got a steeper angle on the, on the, on the grind. It's, again, it's a traditional grind. It's um, just a steeper grind. So that has the effect of adjusting my tool position, my, my sort of tool shaft and handle position. So now I'm going all the way to the middle. Probably see more on that one, wouldn't you? So I'm trying to get every cut to go all the way to the middle of the bowl. That way I don't leave any divots in the middle or, or little bumps. The way I always visualize this, <coughs> imagine my hand is the bottom of the bowl. Put it there. Um, let me switch cameras up there. Imagine my hand's the bottom of the bowl. I want my gouge to be in a position when I hit the center. So, so the bevel points exactly across the bottom of the bowl. So I adjust my handle. So when I hit the middle, the bevel's pointing straight across the bed of the lathe at 90 degrees. That way, the bottom of my bowl becomes flat. If my gouge is a little bit too high, I'm still cutting downwards when I hit the bottom. So what I do is cut that in the bottom of the bowl. I cut a little divot in the bottom of the bowl. If I bring the handle too far around, then I end up cutting that way. <coughs> so what I do in the bottom of the bowl is that. I leave a pimple in the middle. So to get the bottom flat, you've got to be cutting straight across when you hit the middle. At this point, I'm taking light shavings. Switch the camera again. Cut all the way to the middle. So I'm just trying to blend any little bumps and ridges all the way to the middle there. Because as I said earlier, I, I want to minimise sanding on this to get, and to do that, I need to get as smooth a curve as possible. So I haven't got lots of material to, to remove when we get to the sanding stage. So I can use my dividers to go. That's as far as I can go with the divide, with the calipers to the, to the base. And I can see at that point, my thickness is about double. So I can take another cut. And then one last very light finishing cut. That's got it. Yep. Oh, went through the knot there. So yeah, my wall thickness at the bottom is, is a, a, a millimeter or so thicker than the wall at the top. So that, that's about where I want it. So I'm happy to leave it at that point. So 
So next stage would be to sand inside and out. I'm not going to do that at this point. What I'm going to do is just take it out. And I'm just going to look at that under a light. And no, there's, there's, there's no translucency in that wood whatsoever, surprise, surprisingly. But switch to that camera and you can see there outside shape and, and the thickness about two millimeters. I'll measure it. I'll just get my calipers. Got some digi digital verniers here, but I think we're at about two mil. Yep, 2.4 ish. And it's about the same top and bottom of the edge. So that, that could have gone a little bit thinner, but as I said, um, for today, that's that's close enough. <clears throat> so that's that's how I would attack um, a thin walled turning. So I hope that was of use. And if you have got any questions, fire away. Uh, that is very good. We well, a few things. Oh, I do get a problem sometimes. The cat's trying to get in a ball, and I use a scraper. Is that roughening the green up? So you can say that again. I st if I'll get a catch sometimes using the the bowl gouge, yes, on the yep. end. So I use the scraper, but I do get a roughing of the timber inside. Yeah, I, I, you can use a timber across, if I hold that up. You could use the bit I've got between my fingers. Yeah, is probably where you can use the scraper and get a cut, good cut because you're almost on side grain there. You're across the sort of face of the bowl, but when right. you come up here you're into the end grain and then you, you've got more difficulty getting a clean cut with a scraper because you're scraping across end grain. Ah, so yes. up there, you'll probably find the scraper causes more tear than it solves. But you can use it to, to smooth out the bottom across here. On the, I mean, I mean on the inside, but I'm just putting my fingers okay, out. So yes, you, know yeah. what I mean. yeah. um, you can get shear scrapers and things like that that will allow you to shear scrape the inside of the bowl um that's that's probably one way of getting a shear cut or scraping cut all the way around the the inner the inner surface of that bowl you can see there where that knot was yeah. and that <laughs> fissure so so that's a weakness in the wall that's why i didn't want to go any thinner than i did because i thought although at the top here it, it does appear to be solid wood there is signs of a flaw there so i thought i'm not going to push my luck and go so thin that that actually comes apart so um that's like, a button hole. Did, but... <laughs> like a buttonhole <laughs> yeah it could be <laughs> but yeah i mean that's why i wasn't too fussed about the knot falling out because you've still got that fissure which is like an inch and a half up the wall of the bowl i thought what, what difference is it not going to make <sighs> it just sort of goes with it really but yeah that that i would sand um and these top sections where you've got the the the, the wings if you want to call them that I would sand by hand inside and out and then with the lathe turning sand the bottom section so so you sand this bit with the with, with the machine on and this bit by hand or with um a, like a rotary sander on a drill I've got a, a right angle drill that I use for sanding I, I quite like sanding with that so I could potentially sand the natural edges with that and and then do the bottom half with the lathe running you remove the chicken point mm -hmm. and Paul I will, yes. I'll show you how I do it. I won't do it right now, but I'll show you how I do it. What I've got up on my shelf behind my cameras is lots of these. Just a wooden mandrel. This was the bottom of something else I parted off. So they're made out of all sorts of bits of wood, but it's got a chuck spigot on it. So that goes in the chuck. Then I put a pad between that and the bowl. And my pad usually consists of something like this. It's a bit of non-slip router mat and a bit of kitchen roll folded up so that the, the router mat goes against the mandrel and the um the kitchen roll goes against the bowl because by this point i will have sanded and finished the inside of the bowl so i don't want to damage the finish that goes against the inside of the bowl and then i just bring up the tail stock against that stub that i've left and then i can turn this spigot away or reshape the bottom of the bowl to become my foot and, and that's why i often prefer a spigot to a recess with a spigot i can think yeah that's going to be the foot of the bowl so i just leave enough wood there to to be able to re-cut that 
to to finish the the bottom of the bowl. So that that's often how I finish my bowls. With I mean I've got vacuum chucks and cold jaws and stuff like that. You obviously can't use cold jaws on an edge like that. It just don't. Yeah, work. yeah. Um, but if it didn't have a hole in it, I could probably use a vacuum chuck. That Brush presents a bit of a problem for a vacuum chuck, but um, <laughs> I mean, with some thin walled turnings, I found that they just don't hold on a vacuum chuck anyway, because the wood's that thin, the, 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 the vacuum is sucking air through the wall of the bowl, so it just won't hold. So um, a mandrel like that is, is, is reliable and, and consistent. So um, that, that's often what I do. I'll just grab yeah, a few other thin walled turnings. These are all part turn ones I've done in the past. And again, all, all as yet unfinished. That one there is a piece of ash, sort of an OG shape. The bottom isn't fully shaped yet. But again, I've left enough wood there to be able to follow that curve into the foot and, and shape that and put a very small foot on it because that's just going to be a, a decorative thing. So it's a shallow OG, I would I would say, uh, and that curve will follow into this bottom bit. That's just me leaving a little bit of surplus wood. So when I'm turning the inside of the bowl, I've got enough meat there to, to support the bowl and give me a bit of support. Um, and then I can reshape that bottom and finish it. So that, that one was ash. This one, I think, um, might be sick of it. Not sure what it is. It's got quite a wide grain actually, so I'm not sure what that is. But again, that's turned moderately thin, a couple of millimeters. Um, I've got another one here. That one's cherry. Probably two and a half, three millimeters. Um, just a nice curved sort of shape. And and this one, this was a bit of a sort of not not a very interesting shape. I was just doing this as a as a as a demo sort of de demonstrating a technique sort of thing so it's a bit i haven't even gone full depth on the bottom on that one it's just a rough and ready practice thing really um so yeah there's a, there's a few there i've got one more i'll go i'll go this in the house i'll just go and get it give me 30 seconds there we found it this one here is holly and that's between a half and three quarters of a millimeter thick. It's that Jeez, thin. It's just yeah. it's like paper thin. See that? Yeah, yeah. blimey. There's, there's very little strength to it, but let me swing my lamp round. You see that? Put the light um, behind it. Yeah. Very, yeah, very translucent. And, and with that one, I used the translucency to, to gauge the wall thickness. So once I got the edge to the thickness I wanted, I'll just use that and follow the translucency down to the middle. There's a, there's a thicker bit at the bottom where the foot is, but um, that, that's why there's a dark bit in the middle. But um, yeah, the rest of that is moderately even in thickness, but it sort of developed a little bit of a ripple. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I had this on display. I, I, was, I got it on my stand at a, a show somewhere when I was in the marquee, and it was a bit damp and humid and over... The duration of the show it just buckled a bit and it dried out a bit but it, it never lost that little ripple in the middle it's been there ever <laughs> since so so in, in the end i decided to keep it 